Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Shane, I'm the Current Affairs Specialist here at Spokane Public Library. I'm going to kick it over to Tom and Connor in just a second, but I'm going to start by reading our land acknowledgement, which feels especially poignant tonight. I'm on the traditional homelands of the four bands of the Spokane Tribe of Indians. Upper Band, Middle Band, Lower Band, Chihuahua Band. Since time of memorial, the Spokane Tribe of Indians has lived and cared for these grounds, identifying themselves as flesh of the earth. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. We show gratitude to the land, river, and peoples who have been fishing, hunting, harvesting, and gathering here for generations. May we learn from one another's stories so that we may nurture the relationship of the people of Spokane Tribe and all those who share this land. And now I will kick it over to Connor. Thank you, Shane. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for showing up tonight. Uh, my name is Connor Georgie. I'm the Spokane Tribes Anatomous Program Manager and Tom Billadu, Anatomous Project Lead for the Coeur d'Alene Tribe. Uh, we're here to talk about how we're bringing them back, providing fish passage and reintroducing anatomous fish to the Upper Columbia and Spokane rivers. Uh, this work that we're presenting today is the culmination and product of a lot of project partners. Um, just a few, Casey Baldwin with the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, Laura Robinson with the Upper Columbia United Tribes, uh, Kevin Malone, USGS, uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, many, many others have contributed to this body of work uh, that we're gonna go over today and the planning for the next 21 years. Uh, today we're going to cover a little bit of regional uh, history and context. We're going to talk about the people, the fish, and the river, hydro development, a little bit on mitigation, and then we're going to dive into the meat and potatoes of it, uh, talking about fish passage and reintroduction. Our phased approach, phase one, the work that's been done, phase two, the work that is being done currently and will continue, and then the cultural and educational releases. This work is being performed by the Upper Columbia United Tribes, or UCUT. UCUT is a tribal consortium consisting of five tribes in the Upper Columbia River. Uh, that is the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, the Coeur d'Alene Tribe uh, of Indians, the Kalispell Tribe, the Kootenai Tribe, as well as the Spokane Tribe. It is a consortium, so UCUT helps uh, coordinate Natural, primarily natural resources issues of concern to multiple tribes. These tribes have more than 2 million acres of reservation lands and 14 million acres of aboriginal lands in the Upper Columbia. Within those lands, historically, those rivers supported thousands upon thousands upon thousands of anatomous fish, and those fish are spring chinook, summer chinook, fall chinook, sockeye salmon, lamprey, uh, many, many species that the tribes historically relied upon. Um, the Columbia Basin Partnership Task Force estimated there to be, as you can see, well over a million fish returning to these rivers annually. So from the Columbia River, the Spokane River, all the way up into the headwaters. Currently, zero are returning to our waters. It is extremely difficult, um, not being a citizen of the tribe, to articulate or even comprehend the close connection the fish have to the people. That historic relationship runs extremely deep. These fish are much more than just a meal or a symbol. They are an integral component of the culture. Um, extremely important. For thousands of years, the fish cared for the people and the people cared for the fish. That is until those fish quit returning. There are numerous reasons why returns of anatomous fish began to dwindle uh, at the end of the 1800s, early 1900s. However, they were completely blocked from our waters beginning in 1908 when Nine Mile Dam was constructed on the Spokane River. After that, Little Falls Dam was constructed in 1911, and then Long Lake Dam in 1915. Combined, 
those dams blocked access for anadromous fish to reach Shimmikin Creek, the Little Spokane River, Hangman Creek, and of course, the main stem Spokane. Um, hundreds of miles of habitat. However, Upper Columbia tribes still had access to those fish returning to the main stem Columbia that made their way up to and above Kettle Falls until Grand Coulee Dam was completed in 1941. And subsequently in 1955, Chief Joseph Dam was constructed and its completion really created the expansion of what we call the blocked area of the Upper Columbia. So all those historically occupied habitats from Chief Joseph Dam to the Canadian border, including the Spokane River, the Sam Poyle River, um, all those productive habitats were blocked. Not just because of this blockage, but because of all the other impacts of the hydropower system. Uh, in 1980, the Northwest Power Act was passed by Congress. Um, among the provisions in the act, it established the Northwest, what is now known as the Northwest Power and Conservation Council to ensure uh, reliable and affordable energy is made available by this hydropower system. It also requires the mitigation of lost resources, not just the mitigation of those, <clears throat> excuse me, resources lost, but also the preservation and expansion of those remaining resources. So a lot of times when you hear about the work being done by not just the tribes, but also state agencies and others uh, that comes from mitigation, it is often, especially in our area, to preserve those remaining resources, both fish and wildlife. Uh, Tom and I have built in a couple of points where we take a pause for Q&A, um, and here's our first point. So. If the audience has any questions, we are happy to take questions uh, from you at this time, going over what we just covered. There's a lot more to come. What effects does the Post Falls Dam have? I think Tom would be better suited to handle the Post Falls Dam. Sure, so Post Falls Dam has a, a lot of impacts, especially to Lake Coeur d'Alene. Um, it regulates the level of Lake Coeur d'Alene in an unnatural state. It also serves not just as, you know, there's a lot of detrimental impacts to the resources upstream of Post Falls Dam, but you can imagine the amount of water that's held back behind Post Falls Dam serves as this kind of cornerstone for hydropower development or production downstream. As water is released out of Lake Coeur d'Alene, it runs through all those hydro projects that are downstream throughout the Spokane River and helps generate a lot of power um, through all those Avista projects. And it, specific to salmon, they stopped at the falls. They couldn't overcome the falls. So that reach from Spokane Falls up to what was Post Falls, um, it didn't historically have salmon. It had a lot of other really important fish species um, and it had negative well, impacts. Salmon didn't go up that way. No, okay. they couldn't make it. That's that's a big jump. They're powerful, but they couldn't get over that. Yep. The, the furthest upstream they could go and in into Idaho would have been taking a hard ride into Hangman Creek and heading up into the headwaters into the southern end of the Coeur d'Alene Reservation. Yes, sir. So, is it have we is it possible to like undo the damage that we've already done? Do you think like realistically? Because like I heard that back in like you know, the 1800s, people used to come from all over the country to come fish here, and that there was like tons of fish, and now it's like, I just literally, it's like we literally took the ecosystem and just That's That's a good description. <laughs> that is. <laughs> it's an apt description. Um, so, <laughs> when we get into the impacts on what was lost, there was runs of salmon that used to go above Grand Coulee Dam that will never come back. Those stocks, those genetic stocks are gone. They're gone. And when we talk about, you see pictures, uh, Connor had one up earlier of what they call June hogs. And these were just enormous Chinook salmon yeah. that would come up. And, you know, you can imagine if someone's harvesting a 75 pound Chinook at Little Falls on the Spokane River, 
That fish was well over 100 pounds when it entered the Columbia, coming from the ocean. And those stocks of fish, are, they're gone. Yeah, they don't even have salmon have that big anymore, do they? They're around. They're not, they're not very <laughs> abundant, and obviously not abundant up here. So we, we can't undo all the damage done, but we're certainly trying to bring back yeah, uh, some of the better, pieces that have been lost. Better ways to get power. Like, I don't get why everybody wants to live in the freaking past. <laughs> and, and who knows, you know? I mean, it, it's interesting when we work, we're working for the tribes, and they've got this vision of seven generations out and what can happen in hundreds of years from now and that's the idea here right is trying to build on that message and create something that could be for grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren like and if hydropower isn't necessary at that time then maybe something else is and and that may be more appropriate and we can <laughs> move on from <laughs> leave it to elon musk yeah, there you go <laughs> Other questions, or are you ready to jump into the phased approach? Tom, that's you. We're going to get kind of science heavy here, so bear with us a little bit. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to just raise your hand or blurt out whatever is on your mind, and we can try to clarify this as we're going forward. Um, and, and hopefully we don't... People don't start falling asleep on us. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about what we've been up to just in the last about 10 years as far uh, related to reintroduction, um, specifically trying to evaluate how feasible reintroduction is or what's the process we need to get through so we can have a successful reintroduction of salmon back into the blocked area. Um, the idea of reintroducing anadromous fish, establishing some naturally reproducing runs that are supported by, you know, we're not gonna kid ourselves in this state, in the, the state of the environment right now, there has to be some type of hatchery mitigation that goes along with it, hatchery production of salmon to support runs of salmon this far up into the Columbia. There really isn't, there's very few runs of salmon in the Columbia River that exist today that are not supported by some level of hatchery production. So that, that's a message that gets lost sometimes in this, that we're trying to restore just a naturally producing self-sustaining run of salmon with all the impacts that are going on in the basin downstream of Grand Coulee and Chief Joseph. It's just hard to imagine that that's feasible in today's day and age. Why are we doing this? Uh, first and foremost is to right those historic wrongs, you know, to provide the culture, the spirituality, and the rights of the indigenous peoples that used to inhabit these lands. There's also a fair amount of ecosystem processes that salmon help support. Salmon are deemed what we call a keystone species, and they're providing nutrients that they're bringing up from the ocean and re-injecting back into the ecosystem and supporting all, all kinds of production that we've just lost those nutrient resources that um, that used to be so abundant in the area. And it, even with, um, you know, e even today with salmon runs and we talk about hatchery production and habitat restoration, that's an industry in and of itself. There's support for jobs and not to mention recreation and sport fishing. That is a huge piece of the economy in the, in the Columbia River Basin. And it's something we shouldn't ignore. And it's a benefit. It's a benefit to us. It's a benefit to the region. It's a benefit to everybody downstream as well. And then uh, lastly, we're dealing with a system now or an ecosystem that is going through a lot of changes and climatic changes. Um, we see years like 2015 and 2021 where the rivers are getting so hot, salmon aren't have the adult salmon are dying in the river as they're trying to navigate back up. Um, they're running out of places to find that are cool throughout the year to support production. And as we get into these higher latitudes and systems like the Spokane River that are supported by a lot of groundwater input, trying to provide some level of resiliency for these runs and give them an area of habitat that they can sustain themselves in. And you know, the map we had up earlier 
really just identified the U.S. portion of the blocked area. There is a lot of Columbia River up in Canada that is all glacier fed still. I mean, thousands of miles, thousands of kilometers, sorry, if there's any Canadians in the audience. Thousands of kilometers of, of river habitat north of the international border. Um, Is it possible this, to cool down the rivers enough to like be able to have them spawn again through those rivers, or like we have to make like new, like build like man-made like places for them to do it? So there's there's a fair amount of other things we're doing aside from just get, trying to get salmon back into these habitats, and that is a, a lot of ecosystem restoration. And the focus of a lot of the restoration we do is to provide cool and clean water to, to provide a home for salmon when we can get them back to, and a home that can persist for, for hundreds of years. And we'll be talking about that at the Spokane River Forum, April 26th and 27th. That's a great plug. Here? In the library? Not in the library. Uh, location to be determined. I think it's in the convention center. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through this whole slide here. Just this, <laughs> the idea here was to kind of get a, a view of the momentum that we're going through. You know, this timeline starts in 2003, really for the tribes, the idea of reintroduction started the minute Nine Mile Dam was constructed and it blocked those runs from going back up Hangman and getting to Spokane Falls. That vision has never gone away from the tribes. This is more of an idea to give you kind of a, a view of what's going on on a policy level in the federal government and the state and the momentum that has been built since 2003 when reintroduction was first identified in the Fish and Wildlife Program. And that goes back to what Connor was talking about with the Northwest Power Act and the mitigation that goes on in the basin for those lost resources. Um, you can see just by this timeline that just within the last couple of years, Things are really starting to stack up. We're getting federal action agencies on board. We're getting injections of money into this to make this a reality, which is really exciting. It keeps Connor and I really busy, though, that's for sure. And how are we gonna go about doing it? So Connor mentioned the phased approach and the phased approach is, was something that was identified actually first by what we call the 15 Tribes Coalition. There's a joint paper that was done between the tribes in the US and the indigenous nations in Canada to come up with a, a plan for moving forward on how we get salmon back into the basin. This was later adopted by the Northwest Power and Conservation Council through the Fish and Wildlife Program back in 2014. Um, and it was a phased approach. Phase one, which the Yukut tribes completed in 2019, was really, the idea was to evaluate what passage may look like, the opportunities for fish passage at those high head dams, investigate what habitat is still available in this blocked area, How, what are the salmon species that may be most suitable for those habitats, and then the, the, the possible costs for upstream and downstream passage options. And it was kind of an exercise in economics and, you know, <laughs> based on what we know now for passage, how much would it cost to get salmon back up here? Um, not as much as you think, honestly, and especially compared to the benefits that salmon would bring to this region and the amount of money that's already being generated from hydropower operations, specifically at Grand Coulee and Chief Joseph Dam. So, I heard that like, the only, it only, like here, the, this dam only powers like 30% of the city or just, like only downtown now, like all the other power comes from somewhere else, so at least that's what I heard. So all these dams are hooked up into a, a grid, right? And they all transmit power across the whole region, not just the Northwest. Some of the power goes up into Canada, some goes down to California. But just to give you an idea how much power is generated, Grand Coulee Dam alone has enough power to power, or uh, generates enough electricity to power the city of Seattle. Um, and I, I can't remember exactly the revenue off of it, 30. Don't look at me. Okay, I'm not, I don't want to misquote me, but it's a lot of money a year that Grand Coulee Dam alone um, gets off of power generation off of that facility. 
um, going back to the phased, phased approach here, phase two is where we're at now. We're underway, we're just starting in this infant stages of phase two, and the idea of phase two is to test the feasibility of reintroduction. To design and test these, these and put together studies and research for strategies on what may be appropriate for fish passage, um, getting that baseline data on what fish are doing now in those current conditions, and, and really, it's this adaptive approach as we move through, um, as we start to gather data on these studies, building off of that and figuring out what is most efficient and effective as we move forward. And phase three would be using all those results to move into full reintroduction, have permanent passage at Chief Joe Grand Coulee in the Spokane River dams, and have a permanent funding source and capacity to carry on into perpetuity. Just to touch on a little bit on phase one, um, we started back in 2014, completed in 2019. It was largely a tribal effort. The tribes put forth nearly $2 million to do the phase one project. Very little federal support on this. Um, the idea was to try to find what donor stocks would be appropriate for reintroduction back in the blocked area. Again, as we talked about earlier, a lot of those stocks that used to be present in the blocked area are extinct now. Um, and so there are fish just downstream of Chief Joe, current anadromous runs that would likely be most appropriate for this area. What the risks are to reintroducing fish up here, not just the risk to the, the salmon that are coming back in the area, but the risk to the resident fish that are um, inhabiting the, the blocked area habitats now. And then, um, I mentioned earlier the habitat assessment. The habitats have changed a lot up here. We've got 150 miles of reservoir behind Grand Coulee, which used to be a free-flowing river. And there was a lot of questions about whether or not that habitat that's changed so much could support fish going forward. And then really the meat of this, and a lot of people have a lot of questions about, is it can you effectively pass fish above Chief Joe and Grand Coulee can you get adults up? Can we get juvenile fish to go downstream effectively and survive at a high enough rate so we can support adults to come back? And that really, you know, getting adults upstream is a, is, is a challenge. Um, really the biggest challenge is how do we get juvenile fish out and down to the ocean? And then what are the possible outcomes? We did a, a fairly extensive tabletop exercise, a modeling exercise with a fair amount of assumptions plugged into it to generate an estimates of production. The conclusions of this, the, there are donor stocks available. Um, we think the risks are manageable. There is a lot of habitat in the blocked area still that can support production of Chinook salmon, sockeye, steelhead. Um, there are already fish, past fish passage technologies that exist. And the life cycle model, the outcomes of that gave us pretty promising results that we could have a fairly good robust run of salmon coming back into the blocked area. What are, what are some of the technologies that do exist for the fish passage? Or are you getting into that later? Uh, we, we, we'll get into that a little bit later, but it could run from, you know, as simple as intercepting fish, putting them in a truck and bringing them up, or there's other fish passage technologies that we could actually get fish and bring them around the dams and back into those habitats. But yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the idea as we go into phase two is to try to figure out what may be the most effective way to get fish back and try to answer that question uh, as we get into phase three. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, just know that we wrote the report, we put it out, we asked a fair number of agencies and independent scientists to review it they all came to the same conclusion that, yes, this could be successful. There's certainly a lot of uncertainty with it, um, but we would need to put together a plan so we can go forward and address that uncertainty. And that's where we're at now in the phase two.
This is a good natural spot to stop if someone has any more questions about phase one. Yeah, Shane. I remember reading about the, over the summer, there was like a whole, uh, those details are a little fuzzy now, but there was like a whole thing of putting salmon like here, right? Is that right? And then, so was that part of your project? And then do they, what are the expectations for those fish? Yeah, so that is, I guess you could say it's part of our project. It's not specifically tied to the research and the studies. It's uh, kind of a parallel effort to get salmon back in the region, raise awareness and um, gain some knowledge going forward on what could happen to salmon in the area. And we will certainly touch on that a little bit more. Don't they have like, oh, isn't there a way that we could like make it to where build something to help fish get through dams? So the answer to your question is yes, there is certainly ways to get salmon around projects, hydroelectric projects, even ones as big as Grand Coulee Dam. Like without having to take them out of the river? Yeah. To, to some degree. <laughs> we keep them in water the whole time and there are ways to do it without actually putting your hands on a fish and physically moving them from one place to the other. Yes. I was curious when you were talking about the adult person the young fish you said you felt like the older fish you could teach them going up but you were more concerned about the younger salmon why was that so in order to get a good number of adults coming back enough juveniles have to survive to get down to the ocean when juveniles are out migrating they're picking the path that the river is taking them to and typically when you get a dam that doesn't have fish passage on it that path is going to take them through the turbines and turbines aren't especially friendly to fish. You get, you know, more survival, higher survival values than you would think for a fish that's running through a big turbine. But, um, you know, in some systems where half the fish die going through a turbine, it's just not sustainable to have enough fish come back as adults. Um, and the sheer number of juveniles that are going out at one time then can make it difficult to, how do you intercept enough of them to where they don't go through the turbines and they get around that project safely to where you can have enough of them get to the ocean, grow up to an adult and come back. Do you know how to do that? Some people do. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so that? Yeah, yeah. There's been uh, a fair amount of engineering and research done on how to do just that. Yes. And we'll get into that. Uh, Is it possible to take out one or two dams in a river for the fish to swim up? Because I, I look one time and there's way too many dams. Way too many dams on this river. And I thought, why can't they take out at least two? Is that possible? Okay. That, um, so you're asking a person that is an advocate for salmon on that. And, you know, for me, it's... <laughs> I, I would say it's physically possible to take out a dam. Yes. But you also have to recognize that there's a lot of benefits that those dams provide. Benefits that our society and our cities are heavily reliant on. And so those are all considerations that you have to take uh, before you make a decision like that. Here's an idea. It, it's an idea, and it's not the first time we've heard it. Um, but we believe that we can do this while maintaining all of the benefits of those dams, their current operations, and provide and bring salmon back and have it be an additive benefit to the system. And a, a lot of those projects, when, especially when we're talking about Grand Coulee Dam and Chief Joseph Dam, that are owned and operated by federal government. Um, you know, and these are the same individuals who we need to work with on trying to restore salmon back into these areas. So. For us, a, a great strategy going forward is to, can we do this while maintaining those benefits that those projects provide, and at the same time getting support from those federal agencies that own and operate those dams? Have you gotten so, support? We have, yes we have. Um, by most federal action agencies, we have got support from them, yes. Okay, I'm gonna move into phase two, where we're at now. So it is, after we finished phase one, we went through this review process. 
they gave us a lot of great pointers on where to move forward. We had some ideas on how to move forward on this as well. We came up with this stepwise and an adaptive approach to test the feasibility of restoring salmon. The idea with this is to just not go head first into the pool and start building you know, $100 million projects to get fish around dams without knowing that it can be possible. So as we move into this phase two, it's kind of this study phase. What's the best approach moving forward? Can we actually do this um, and meet our goals, meet the goals of the tribes, meet the goals of the communities, and how can we do it in a cost-effective and efficient manner? And, and it, I talk a lot about the tribes and the communities up here, but it's not just for this region up here in the blocked area. Just due to the salmon life history and the way they move down to the ocean and back, it's going to provide a ton of benefits for the entire Columbia River Basin and beyond, even into the ocean fisheries. There's a lot of economies and fisheries that rely on the salmon that go into the ocean, not to mention the ecosystems that rely on salmon in the ocean. There was a lot of discussion earlier, and you probably all remember about, and it's still a, clearly it's an issue, southern resident killer whales. Their main diet is salmon. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that suggests that their main diet is actually summer Chinook that come from the Upper Columbia. And when I say that Upper Columbia, I mean those habitats just below Chief Joseph Dam. So we're talking about an opportunity to not just provide benefits to these ecosystems, but to the economies and the aesthetics and the qualitative well-being of everybody in the region and everything in the region. Um, it's, it's a heck of an endeavor. We've got outlined about a little over 20 years to go through this testing of feasibility. Um, there's a fair amount of gathering baseline data, using that information and moving forward as we start to investigate passage. Um, the idea is to test a lot of the assumptions that we used in that tabletop exercise that I talked about before. Um, there, when we talk about salmon in the Columbia River Basin, we hear a lot about salmon stocks that are in peril and endangered species. Um, our objectives for phase two would rely on species that are not endangered. It doesn't make sense to glean fish off of an already imperiled stock to do studies on. So there are stocks in the upper Columbia that are not necessarily uh, <laughs> they're not living up, to, I guess, to where they were historically, but they're also not in dire straits. And there are surplus fish available to help um, support these studies. Some of those fish that are available, we hope we need to prolifer uh, produce more fish from them to do studies on them, so to develop some type of hatchery facilities to do so. And then start to test, develop and test those upstream and downstream interim passage facilities under current operations, as Connor was talking about earlier and then finally provide that data that's necessary for full-scale reintroduction and permanent passage into the blocked area. As I talked about before, step one is really gathering that baseline data. Um, it's really important for us to be able to have a consistent supply of fish that we can do studies with. And to do so, we need to be able to produce those fish. And the idea is that there are some facilities downstream that can help support production that are already in operation uh, that can be expanded upon or to develop some new facilities up here in the blocked area. And it, in all likelihood, it's going to be a combination of the two. And we're trying to navigate that right now, actually. Um, within step one, two, we're looking at downstream behavior and survival studies under these current operations. So we would mark a lot of fish with acoustic tags, um, and, and look at their behavior and their survival, the juvenile fish as they're moving downstream. We would pit tag a lot of fish too, so we can identify them as they're coming back as adults and do the same type of work on adults, behavior and survival of those. And then within step one, two, and this is uh, fairly important for us moving forward is, <laughs> Reintroduction won't be possible unless we know we can get fat fish past Chief Joe, if we can get adults back up. So having a facility to where we can actually intercept adults right below Chief Joseph Dam, whether it's moving them in the back of a truck 
or um, some other method. And that could be, there are facilities downstream of Chief Joseph Dam already. There's a Chief Joseph Hatchery there that has a ladder on it that supports production of Chief Joe Hatchery. Uh, that could um, provide some method of us intercepting adults so we could get them back into these habitats up here. Um, for fish production and rearing facilities, um, again, this is a very important piece of, of the phased approach. This picture here is actually in the city of Spokane. This is a piece of property that the Coeur d'Alene tribe bought with the idea that it could support aquaculture and fish production for the blocked area. Um, again, we've identified those donor stocks that would be appropriate for reintroduction, but having a place to rear those fish, especially in the blocked area, so they can be acclimated to those habitats is important whether that is on this property here in Hangman Creek or in net pen infrastructure that's already throughout Lake Roosevelt. Um, I, I don't wanna to get too much into the rearing strategies on this if you guys have questions about it, but, but just know that we gotta grow fish and enough fish to where we can gather enough information that we can make conclusions off of going forward. I had a question for me. Yeah. The acoustic versus the pit, um, what are those specifically? So that was a great lead-in right here. Um, acoustic telemetry is a way to mark fish and actively track them as they're moving throughout the habitats. Um, it's a tag you insert inside of a fish and it's giving off a signal constantly. And we can put receivers in the waterways at certain points and it'll detect those fish as they move by. We can also mobily track those fish. We can get in a boat, try to find those fish, um, if they're holding up in certain areas. Um, the idea with acoustic telemetry is to get really refined data on what fish are doing on a behavioral level and a survival level. So with this type of acoustic telemetry study, we're trying to get a handle on passage survival. So as fish are moving actually across a concrete structure like Nine Mile Dam or Long Lake Dam, what is their survival from whether they're going through the spillway or through the turbines? Um, it can also give us a great idea on survival in, in certain river reaches. Um, for example, the reservoir behind Long Lake Dam, Lake Spokane. We know the fish community in that area is a lot different than what it used to be. It's a, it's a large reservoir. We can gather data on how long it takes fish to move through that reservoir. We can also, also gather on data on how many fish survive as they went from the top of the reservoir to the bottom of the reservoir. A pit tag, on the other hand, um, is a passive tag. The, the tag actually has to go through an antenna. The antenna energizes it, and then it puts off a signal. Um, in almost all of the, the um, dams downstream of Chief Joseph, there are pit tag antennas that fish have to swim through. Mm -hmm. And we can get an idea of from release point to that first antenna, how long it took a fish to go. Out of all the fish we pit tag, how many of them survived. It'll also give us good information on, out of all the juveniles we have released with pit tags, how many came back as adults. So we can get a really good handle on an ultimate life cycle survival piece. It's, it's the exact same tag that's in your dog and cat. Um, it's injected into the back. And so you these, what's that? You have to catch them. You, well, you, almost, almost. You can have an antenna going across the stream. So if you really want to mess with us, you send your dog swimming in the river over our pit tank antenna. We're going to wonder what fish is Back that. Back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah so totally. Fish. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, you know, I talked about this a little bit earlier. Get an idea of adult chinook and, and sockeye survival. So the idea is to tag enough juvenile chinook and sockeye release them in blocked area habitats, let them go on down to the ocean and start coming back, and we can get an idea of what we call a small to adult return ratio, or a juvenile to adult return survival. And if we know all of, of the pit tag numbers of the fish in a specific release group, so all those juveniles coming out of Hangman, uh, then we can measure their success specifically and compare that to say, fish coming out of the Sampoel River or from Kettle Falls we can combine all those tags and evaluate the whole program 
um, and the reintroduction effort as a whole. So it really provides a lot of information for us. Thanks. Yeah, each one of those tags has a unique identifier, just like the ones we all, or most of us put in our dogs. It doesn't just say there's a tag in this animal. It says what tag it is and when that fish was tagged, where that fish was released. It's an enormous database that the, um, a lot of the fish managers in the Columbia River Basin use. Um, once adults come back and we know they came from the blocked area because of that pit tag they have in them, we can then put acoustic tags in them as well. And we can monitor the adults' behavior as they move throughout that same blocked area habitats that the juveniles had to navigate their way out of. So there's a lot of questions about what are adults going to do once we put them back into these habitats. Um, will they survive to find spawning habitat? Will they go back to where they actually came from? Um, there's also questions about how they behave as they approach a new dam. So if we release a, an adult Chinook just above Grand Coulee Dam, it swims up, goes into the Spokane Arm, and hits Little Falls Dam, how is it approaching that dam? And that can give us a lot of information on where, what adult passage could look like at that project, where we would want to place it, like whether it's on the left shore or the right shore, so we can most effectively intercept those adults and get them around that project as well. Uh, we talked a little bit about trap and haul, and, and trap and haul is not a new thing. Um, and it's likely trap and haul will support a lot of these studies going forward. Trap and haul just means trapping an adult fish as it approaches a project, specifically Chief Joseph Dam here, getting it in a, a, you know, a holding area, and then we can physically put it in a truck and drive it around those dams and put it in those habitats that we want to do studies on it. So if the first dam, Chief Joe, is preventing them to coming up to nine, nine mile, how about just bypassing all the other dams and take them past <laughs> nine miles so we can get them up here to Haven Creek? Yeah, and that, for especially for those fish that are released from Hangman Creek, for example, that would be what we would likely do with those fish, especially during these phase two studies. The ultimate pie in the sky is that we wouldn't have to trap and haul any fish and they could make their way around each dam on their own and, and pick and choose their route and go back to where they wanna go without us having to interfere in their migration whatsoever. But in all likelihood, especially during these first years of the studies, we would put them in trucks and bring them back to where they were released from. And what's the mortality of, of the fish being hauled? Uh, very low, very low. Um, I would say, so we've been moving fish for these releases in the Spokane, and we haven't had a single adult die on us yet while we do it. Okay. And um, as long as you can provide the fish with cold water and oxygen, they do just fine in these trucks. Okay. I, as I said before, phase two is a 20 year project. That first step is really focused on gathering that baseline data. The second step, which spans years seven through 21, is really focused on passage. So we would continue to operate interim hatchery facilities, releasing juvenile fish into the blocked habitats, tagging these fish, tracking their ways downstream and back up, continue trap and hauling these fish from Chief Joseph Dam into some of these different blocked area habitats. But we would also begin incrementally installing different passage projects at each hydroelectric facility. And really that sequence of doing so is going to be informed by the data we gather during that first six years. Um, there, there's going to be a fair amount of trial and error when it comes to, to passage, especially at huge projects like Grand Coulee and Chief Joseph Dam but we're trying to gather enough data to where we don't have to spend as much time as we would need without just shooting in the dark on this. So, and, and there is a lot of really smart individuals, engineers and fish passage designers that have been doing this for decades in the region. And it's likely they have really good ideas on where that would be appropriate and, and what would be appropriate those projects. Um, but as much data as we can feed them, the better off we're gonna be. Um, and then there's this kind of this long-term RM&E. So 
I've talked a lot about hatchery fish and releasing fish with tags, but we know full well that when adults come back, they're gonna spawn and they're gonna produce juvenile fish that we won't be able to get our hands on. And these will all be naturally produced fish. So how can we track production of those fish? And a way we can do that is with genetics and we call it parentage-based tagging. If we can get a genetic marker off of every adult we move into the blocked area, they produce offspring, those offspring go down to the ocean and then come back as adults. We can get our hands on them and get a genetic clip. We know exactly what parent that fish came from. Um, and it's actually a really low cost way when you think about the amount of money and time it takes to handle fish and tag fish. Those acoustic tags that we talked about earlier, those are $250 a piece. And so if we're tagging a thousand fish in a year, that that's a lot of money that you got to put forth to track these fish survival and their behavior. Genetics is a way where we can get a lot of data for a little bit amount of money and get good data on um, production in the blocked area of naturally produced fish. So getting into this downstream passage, I talked about earlier that this piece is really important and how we can effectively get juveniles downstream by and, and maintaining some level of survival to where we get enough returning adults to be able to support a run. Um, there's a fair amount of technologies available. We may find out that some of these dams don't need juvenile fish passage. Um, if you've been out to the Spokane River dams, especially in the spring runoff, you'll see there is a lot of water going over the spillways of those projects. You go to Nine Mile Dam and they have what they call a sediment bypass tunnel that they open up and you know it's a five foot diameter tunnel that just shoots water through. It doesn't go through the turbines. After that, all the other flows are going over the spillway. That project can only support about 6,000 CFS. Spring runoff in the Spokane is upwards of 20,000 CFS or more. So the majority of the water going over Nine Mile Dam is going over the spillway. And it's likely that's where those juvenile fish will queue. And instead of going through the turbines, they may just go over the spillway and their survival could be high enough to where we wouldn't need juvenile passage at that project. Now, Grand Coulee Dam is a totally different story. That, that dam is a serious powerhouse and that's what it's meant to do is to generate electricity. And they try to do it as much energy is produced out of that project as possible. And 95% or more of the flows that go through Grand Coulee in a given year are going through the turbines. And there's got to be a way to intercept those fish before they go through the turbines at Grand Coulee Dam. And this is one example that's being employed throughout the region. It's called a floating surface collector. Um, these systems sit in front of a project, fish go into them, and then you either move them around the dam, you can do it manually in a truck, they can go into a pipe and just on down the dam and uh, back to the other side and away they go. Um, in some projects, they can be really effective. Um, and we hope that that will be the case at Grand Coulee Dam. I, I think it's important to note that the scale and the width across the Grand Coulee Dam is nearly a mile wide. And so that's why that acoustic data is so important to figure out where those juveniles are approaching the dam and are they naturally congregating in an area that makes them much easier to collect? Or are we gonna have to guide them to a location and bunch them up and then collect them? And so that's why that acoustic data is so important. And we've got information to suggest that they naturally bunch up on their own. So we're pretty optimistic about that. So how would you get the adults back up over there? <laughs> Is that your next that's, slide, Tom? <laughs> that's like a 300-foot rise, I believe. Yeah, you're right. So Grand Coulee is a very large dam, not just a mile across. It's a very tall dam as well. And when we think about like traditional fish ladders, something like that would likely not be appropriate at Grand Coulee Dam. It would have to extend for miles downstream for salmon to be able to effectively swim up that to get up, up and around Grand Coulee Dam. Um, there are other opportunities for passing fish around dams. Um, there's things they call salmon elevators. There's, again, trap and haul. If we can get enough fish into a truck and move them around. There's also novel technologies like um, this picture here in the lower, lower part of the slide is uh, whoosh technologies. And 
it's been termed a salmon. Okay. The, the cool thing about novel technologies like Woosh is they really take minimal operation, they take minimal amounts of water to be able to move fish really quickly from point A to point B. Um, and, and it may not just be Woosh, we met with a group out of Scandinavia, uh, Fish Heart. That is, it's using something similar. It's basically moving fish in, into a holding area, putting them into a pipe and using water that moves up the pipe and, and with the fish, water and fish and everything, and out the other side. And I think it's important, that's a relatively new technology. So the, the industry, the technology has not stopped evolving. It is continuing to progress and improve. And so uh, there could be other options that we're not aware of or other options that somebody hasn't quite yet developed. And maybe this will spur that development. And are the, do the juveniles go back to the ocean in the spring when there is a potential spill over the smaller dams? Typically, that is the time of year juveniles are out migrating when the flows are the highest. Yep. So just out of sheer curiosity, um, so I guess when we constructed the dams that we now have and the wonderful benefit that they provide, that, we, that the, the construction just didn't worry about fish, just didn't worry about this topic. Because it's just even listening to you talk, there are all, there are some things, and maybe they didn't know at that time. But was the priority just on, you know, we got to create this power structure, and this is what we're going to do, and this idea of oh, the fish will they'll be okay. We just didn't worry about that. I mean, that's kind of a broad statement, but I mean, when you look at what happened, you kind of pretty well put a stop to things. That's a really complicated history topic, and it's fun to dive into. Um, I'm not sure it, it's fair to make a blanket statement that they just didn't care, um, because some folks cared. Uh, to mitigate for that blockage of Grand Coulee, uh, the federal government built a series of hatcheries in the Upper Columbia, uh, thinking that they could make more fish um, then were produced or being lost from the blocked area. Those hatcheries were developed specifically to support commercial and recreational fishing and not necessarily to support uh, tribal fisheries. And so it is a very complicated history topic, um, the success of which is varied. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I, I didn't realize until, you know, it wasn't all that long ago that when they built Grand Coulee Dam, started building it in the 30s, um, <clears throat> the fish runs in the Columbia were really in bad shape. And, they, and it was mainly due to overharvest downstream. There was people down near the mouth of the Columbia River that had built what they called fish wheels. And it was a, a place where fish would swim into, they'd get intercepted, and they'd go straight to the cannery. And it just decimated the runs in the Columbia River. And so, you know, when they built Cooley, I, I'm pretty sure they talked about whether or not they should have fish passage at Grand Cooley Dam. Um, but the runs were in pretty bad shape at the time, and they probably figured, well, there's not that many salmon in the Columbia River as it is right now, and we can build these hatcheries and we can just make more downstream and support, like what Connor was saying, those commercial and canning fisheries. The Grand Cooley was also petitioned by farmers in eastern Washington and the political representatives. They went to Franklin Roosevelt and said, we need to irrigate the desert. It wasn't built for power. It's not even mentioned in the petition. It was only built to provide some power to electric city and small towns around it. It really wasn't until they put the third powerhouse in the 60s that it generates the power that it does now. And now we're getting into an even more interesting topic because <laughs> it was being considered coming right out of the Dust Bowl. Yep. Um, yep. And I just read a book about the Dust Bowl and it was horrendous and no wonder they wanted to irrigate and have an alternative water source. So it, it, it's a very complex history. Yep. Well, also you have to realize that in 1908, 1911, 1914, when those, some of those dams were going in, not Grand Coulee, of course, but the ones upstream. General American society was thinking that the Native American would be extinct. 
there, there wasn't a thought of, oh, we need to do this for their culture, because the general perception was that culture will be gone. It will be assimilated into the broad population and not even exist. Why you have people like Edward Curtis who took the photography that he took. He was trying to capture the last of the Indian because it was never expected at the time, generally, that the people would still be around. <coughs> I mean, it's a, you talked about it, a deep topic or an interesting historical review, and I mean, it is on so many levels. And dark. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, very. So uh, let's move on from something dark to something a little lighter. <laughs> I'm going to hover behind Connor on this one a little bit. Excellent. Uh, he's been around me enough to know that I need supervision. Um, the tribes pursuing the phased approach, going through the science and the research to bring salmon back, they didn't want to wait. They wanted salmon back now. They've already waited 80 to 100 years. And so we have started performing since 2017 what we call the cultural and educational releases to reconnect the people to the fish and the fish to the river um, and start to rekindle those connections. As Tom mentioned earlier, it also provided us with an opportunity to learn something. Um, so we're not only meeting short-term tribal goals and increasing public awareness, but we're starting to test out some of these concepts that we're thinking about for phase two, different rearing strategies, um, different habitats, different locations, figuring out what success could look like. And so since 2017, uh, the Yukat tribes have released more than 1,400 adult Chinook to the blocked area, from Chief Joe to the Canadian border to Spokane Falls. Um, we've also released nearly 20,000 juvenile fish over those years. Um, those have been pretty special. The Trap and Haul program has really been to support ceremonies um, and restore some of those cultural connections. Uh, the Caulfield Tribe has had multiple ceremonies in Rufus Woods and Kettle Falls. Um, the Coeur d'Alene Tribe had a harvest opportunity on Hangman Creek on their reservation. The Spokane Tribe had a harvest opportunity in Shimakin Creek. And as a fish lover and a catch and release fisherman, I couldn't have been more ecstatic and more thrilled to see all those kids chasing fish around the creek and reconnecting with that resource. It was absolutely moving. That picture of that kid who's weighted up to his armpits with that spear to get that adult just epitomizes everything Connor is talking about. I mean, that kid is smiling ear to ear and just to see something special like that happen is it's hard not to get emotional and get involved in these type of things. That's for sure. So after we've done those releases, we've also done just volitional releases like in the Little Spokane River. Um, uh, the Caulfields over in the Sam Poyle River, and of course, the main stem Spokane. And we, believe it or not, Tom and I don't have a lot of money to work with. We don't have a ton of staff, and we don't have really robust monitoring programs yet. So the monitoring that we do, we try to leverage uh, existing staff, existing activities, and get out there in the water to the capacity that we can. And given that, we've documented some pretty remarkable success. Something that surprised us um, and the communities. We've documented spawning in the Sam Poyle River, in Shimakin Creek, the Little Spokane, the Main Stem Spokane, and Rufus Woods Reservoirs. We have documented juveniles coming out of those systems in Shimakin Creek and in the Sam Poyle River through screw trap monitoring from our resident fish program. And I think all that momentum really started in 2017. The Spokane Tribe re received about a thousand Chinook salmon eggs um, from one of our partners downstream. We didn't have a full-blown hatchery to grow those fish in, so we had what's called a recirculating aquaculture system at our facility. 
Um, it takes a lot of maintenance, a lot of upkeep, and we started to grow those fish. Over time, we lost about 250. You're, you should expect some loss during hatchery production. Admittedly, that's a little bit high, but that was our first time. So we felt pretty good about it. We had 750 fish. We put pit tags on all those fish. And when they were yearlings, we released them into Shimmikin Creek on the Spokane Reservation. So that's that little red star you see on the map. Because a lot of the dams downstream have pit tag antennas on their bypass facilities, we were hopeful that we might be able to detect a few fish coming out. Those 750 fish had to navigate three dams without fish passage facilities, so Little Falls Dam, Grand Coulee, Chief Joseph. That includes 120 kilometers of storage reservoir. It is Lake Roosevelt under current conditions, current operations. And that's all before they even reach nine more dams on the main stem Columbia. So we were really shocked when we started getting reports from the big comprehensive database that 90 individuals were detected below Chief Joseph Dam. 24 of those were at or below Bonneville Dam. And we know even more survived because those antennas don't detect every single fish. They can only be so efficient. And then two years later, we got another ping. And another, and another, and another. And we watched as one fish started to make her way back up the main stem Columbia. Over the course of two weeks, we watched her as she climbed over all those nine dams over Wells Dam and was hanging out at the base of Chief Joseph Dam. She got there the day the recreational summer Chinook fishery opened. And two weeks went by and we didn't hear anything. We'd already called all the hatcheries downstream saying, hey, can you keep an eye out for, these, for this one fish? Yeah, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll take a look. Nobody, nobody thought that fish would show up anywhere. And so we got a call from the Colville tribe two weeks later when in Utsushinit entered their hatchery ladder while they were collecting broodstock. That fish, that one individual, swam up the main stem Columbia and entered a ladder that is essentially maybe as wide as the screen, a veritable trickle entering the Columbia to get as close to her home waters as she possibly could. It was absolutely incredible. There, unfortunately, were policies in place that prevented her from being transported back to the Spokane Tribes of Waters alive, but we were able to receive her body. Her flesh was returned to the river to hopefully call some siblings home while her hide was preserved and is presented in the Spokane Tribes Administrative Building. And I don't know if you want to call it statistics or divine intervention, but the next year, three of her siblings returned. We watched them as they entered the Columbia Basin, overcome several dams. Some made it as far as wells. Some only made it to John Day. Um, but we never got our hands on those fish, and that's okay. I, I guess I take that back. We did get our hands on one of those fish because we got a phone call from Wendy, a uh, Nez Perce fish processor, who read our phone number on the spaghetti tag that we'd implanted on the back of our fish. It had been harvested in a lower river fishery. We told her the story about this fish, and she graciously offered it up to the tribe. So now she's mounted beside her sister in our administration building. And so these cultural and educational releases have provided a proof of concept that fish can survive under current conditions and operations, that a hatchery ladder, the Chief Joe ladder specifically, can collect adults, and there's basin-wide benefits. Those three fish, those were harvested by lower river fisheries. That's it. That's a benefit that we expect from this reintroduction effort. Um, and most importantly, it gave 
not just the Spokane tribe, but I think all the Upper Columbia tribes hope for what's possible and started that healing process. Um, one thing that's really important about this is uh, we talk a lot about learning from fish and learning from studies. These fish, they know what they got to do. They've, they've been doing it forever and ever, way before we were ever here, these fish have been doing it. And they're showing us over and over again that it can be done. And the Coeur d'Alene tribe, we, we saw something similar, experienced uh, something similar to what Connor was talking about here with the Spokane tribe. We released a number of fish, about 1,400, 1,500 juveniles, way up in Idaho in Upper Hangman Creek. It tagged all these fish. These fish had to navigate their way out of the muddy waters of Hangman Creek, across all three dams on the Spokane River, down all those projects to the Columbia River. And two years later in 2022, we saw the same thing. Fish starting to come back from the ocean, trying to come back home, trying to come back to Hangman Creek. And there was two fish, two siblings that were swimming together up the Columbia River and almost crossing each dam at the same time to get back to where they came from. Um, after one of these, both these fish had crossed Wells Dam, we knew they were above Wells Dam and were likely bonking their nose on Chief Joseph Dam trying to get back up. One of those fish actually moved into the same ladder at the Colville Tribes Hatchery and it was, I don't know, Three weeks later, we finally got a phone call from the Colville tribe and we said the same thing. We know our fish is up here. We know it's trying to get back home. Please keep an eye out for this fish. And sure enough, she showed up in the Colville tribe's hatchery. They called us up. They said, we got to get your fish back to you. And that's exactly what happened. Um, in July, July 12th of 2022, we brought she who repeatedly swims back home to Hangman Creek and put her live back into Hangman Creek. This was at that property here in Spokane, at um, the property the tribe calls Squayu, put her back into Hangman Creek and let her go. And this is what it's all about. If it's just one fish that comes back for the tribes, I'm, that's something, that's a lot, that's a hell of a lot more than we have now, which is zero. And this is what we're pushing for right here. We can reconnect these fish back to their home, reconnect the people back to the fish. And to be a part of this ceremony was in it. <laughs> it's hard to talk about now because it's, it's super emotional to see these kind of things go down. And if you can get out to these releases, do it 100%. Get on the ground and watch these fish go back into the rivers. It is amazing. We tried to have a more public activity last year, one of these uh, cultural and educational releases. Uh, the Spokane, uh, the Coeur Lanes and the Spokans were really close peoples. On the things they had was the sam one of the things they had was the salmon celebration in the fall. It was a time of our villages and tribes coming together where everyone was happy. Even the eagles would come. So every year, from the Spokane Falls down to People's Park, not just the Spokans and the Coeur d'Alene's would gather, but tribes from all over the region would come to Spokane and share in the bounty of the Spokane River. Uh, it was a momentous celebration. Last year, the American Fishery Society, uh, the National Society for Fish Biologists meeting was in Spokane, so we had a bunch of fish nerds present at the same place and time that the tribe historically would gather. And you have these two groups that are both extremely passionate about fish. And it seemed like an opportunity um, to have a, a really big celebration. And so we, we did that. Um, the Yukut tribes gathered together for a adult Chinook release to the Spokane. Um, a gathering that hadn't been held in over a century, where fish biologists, uh, citizens of the tribes, came and returned these fish back to their waters. 
after the fact. Uh, we didn't have any tags in these fish. We couldn't monitor them um, by figuring out their movement specifically. So it was a nice excuse for us to go floating on the river and try to find these fish. And sure enough, we did find these fish. Uh, we found more than 32 reds, nests, where those fish spawned. And that was just a, a limited section. We weren't able to cover the entirety of that flowing stretch of the river. So out of these 150 fish that were released, 32 reds um, was a really optimistic start. If you wanna keep track of the reintroduction effort, learn more about the science that we're doing, um, or just to hear the latest on what's going on, you can go to either the UCUT website, the UCUT Facebook page, or apparently email Tom or I <laughs> specific questions uh, about this. Uh, and we will try to do a better job of um, letting folks know when we're going to have a public release um, that the general public may be able to participate in. I was gonna put Connor's cell phone number up there, that, but I decided not to on that one. Uh, and with that, we'll take any last questions. Shane? Yeah, um, you mentioned your funding a couple times, and it just made me wonder, if somebody wanted to like lobby one of their representatives, I don't know if you can answer this, but do you know like, at what level that would be the most fruitful? We are part of the third legislative district here on Saturday, so, but you, you know, like federal, state, what do you think of? So, we, we didn't mention it, but Part of the reason we do a lot of these cultural releases is also to engage with media and outreach and political figures. We, a lot of political members, whether state or federal, come to these releases and it, I think it makes a, a fairly large impact. And we've been fairly successful at getting money through the state of Washington, through the legislative process, and even on a federal level. Um, the Yukut tribes were just notified a couple months ago that we were awarded $5 million out of the federal omnibus bill. This was sponsored by not just Democrats, this was sponsored by Democrats and Republicans. In fact, it was first supported by Kathy McMorris Rogers. So there is bipartisan support to do things like this, to get salmon back, and the, everybody sees the benefit of this. And so, whether it's talking to your, your local county commissioners, to your state representatives, to the federal representatives. I think all of that is appropriate. Yeah, I've got nothing to add to that. It, it, it is valuable at each of those levels, um, local all the way up. Even your city council um, is helpful to let them know that I'm a member of the public and I support this. The city council loves your guys' work, I would like to say that. I've gone to city council and they're very happy and excited about this project, so they're very, they're very ready for it. They've been tremendous supporters of, of our work, that is for certain. Yep. I have a question and then a follow-up question. So the fish that were released into Hangman Creek and Spokane River and Little Spokane River, did all of those go over the Nine Mile Dam, do you think, or did some just hang around in the area between Nine Mile Dam and the, uh, Spokane Falls? Yeah. That's a really good question, and we don't know. <laughs> but previous research um, done by the Colvilles, so these fish are what we call naive. They didn't originate from here. They aren't programmed to the scent of the Spokane River. Um, so these naive fish may or may not want to stick around. And the Colville tribe did some work transplanting naive adult Chinook salmon into Rufus Woods. And they were able to tag those fish and monitor their behavior throughout Rufus Woods Reservoir. And I think only two out of 70 were documented to what we call fall back over the dam. And so, if you get those fish to a spot where they can persist, that they like, um, we've, we have evidence that they'll stick around. My follow-up question is, 
are there other parts of the country, other tribes, other places in the world uh, that have done the same thing that you're trying to attempt to do now? And have you been able to get information from those studies? The answer is yes. <laughs> there's, there's efforts to reintroduce fish, not just throughout the Northwest and salmon, there's a fair amount of efforts to reintroduce fish back east, Atlantic salmon and American eel back up into those habitats. Um, even around the world, there's an interest in, in Europe and Asia in getting salmon back into those historic habitats that were once blocked. And we learn from a lot of professionals, especially in our region, what worked and what didn't work and how we can apply it to our studies that we do up here. Now, I would say that no one has tried to do with this on the magnitude that we're trying to. I'm going to say that this is the single largest reintroduction effort that has probably ever been undertaken in the world. And if there's ever a place to do it, it is in the Columbia Basin and the Northwest. When that review of fish passage technology was being done, they looked internationally for other examples. Um, and the feedback that they got was kind of a chuckle because everybody else looked to the Columbia Basin and the West Coast for what is happening with fish passage. And so the expertise is in the region. Um, you just got to get it done. I saw Jack's hand up in that moment. Well, so as a corollary to that, what kind of feedback did you get from the fish food conference? <coughs> It was overwhelmingly positive. I mean, the ones I talked about. Yeah, yeah they, But if they kept up with it, I mean, they, where, where does it, what can they do to help? The American Fishery Society? I, that's not a group that we've, I guess, asked for continued outreach. Um, they've certainly stayed in touch and have wanted to be updated but that is really a professional scientific journal where they like a lot of numbers and graphs, and that's not what this was about. Um, this was about the history and the experience. Um, but we do stay in touch with them. Yeah, the question about the fish that you released that went out to the ocean that came back to the coma hatchery, and you talked about the time that you were able to track over a period of weeks for her to make it back. Do you know how that compared, the up river journey, compared to historical pre-dam timing of that passage? No, not empirically. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned it was some number of weeks, right? Could you tell two, it what was, that was? It was two weeks that we watched her overcome all those dams first, in the Columbia where she piece. first picked up on the way in? Correct. Bon no, but where was at that? Bonneville Dam. Okay, at Bonneville? The first dam, and it took her two weeks to overcome those nine subsequent dams over wells. Um, That's really way faster than I would imagine in slack water, in a slack water reservoir system. Wow. Yeah, I mean, if you think about what those fish would have historically swam against, yeah. Um, yeah. They, they're built for it. That's wow. that's what they do. Yeah. It, it is really remarkable when we were watching the two fish uh, that were coming back in 2022. They were hitting one dam on one day and getting pinged on the next dam within 24 hours. Just you know, a mission in mind and coming home. That was the idea, and really amazing. You know, I was curious. You were talking about the potential in the future of having them reintroduced to areas where they, are ha they haven't been and that they're other native fish or non-native fish or what would, what's that concern or what, are those, yeah, maybe just a little bit on that. A, a lot of the fish communities that we have up here now are a lot different than the, what they were historically. Uh -huh. We have a fair number of non-native introduced species that reside in, in the habitats now that were never there when, when salmon inhabited those waters. So some of the questions we're trying to answer are, how are those fish, what's their survival and behavior? Is they're now having to navigate through those different communities? Mm -hmm. So there's a risk to that, um, whether it's predation. Um, there are native fish here, though, that 
are still here that were always there, even when Chinook and, or an anadromous fish inhabited those waters. And one of those fish in particular is red band trout. Red band trout is a, the residualized form of a, of a steelhead. Mm -hmm. They're what's left of the anadromous runs that used to inhabit the Spokane River. And um, there was, you know, we looked at what, what would be the risk to those species? If we brought salmon back into these habitats, could it negatively affect red band? The ultimate answer that, that we came to, that we think is no. That if anything, they would help support by providing nutrients and, and uh, uh, ecosystem benefits to those fish that are already here. Did the native steelhead make it over the falls into, into the Spokane Valley River system? Is that? Above Spokane Falls? Yeah. I, I, maybe, you know, back in glaciated times, um, there's no evidence that those steelhead made it up into Lake Coeur d'Alene, though, for example. There's a lot of West Slope cutthroat trout up there. There's no native red band trout above Post Falls. But what's interesting is Hangman Creek is a rock's throw if you go over the ridge to the Coeur d'Alene subbasin. And so, you know, you could make that walk from headwaters of Hangman into the Coeur d'Alene River and the Coeur d'Alene Lake Basin. And, you know, you just don't see those two fish in the same place. Thank you very much. Thank you.